Welcome. I'm Mark Goodsell, New South Wales Head for the Australian Industry Group and a member of Safe Work Australia. And welcome to today's panel session on work-related fatigue as part of uh, Safe Work Australia's virtual seminar series and National Safe Work Week for 2016. First, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet the Ngunnawal people and recognise and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to this city and to this region. Today's panel dis discussion is about work-related fatigue, fatigue in the workplace. And I know many of you will deal with that issue, issue of fatigue in your personal lives, and you'll have strategies to manage it in your personal lives. But it's also a very important issue in workplace risk. And it doesn't only impact on the workers' mental and physical health, it can also impact on the health and safety of those around them in the workplace. At work, fatigue can be a function of many factors. It can be mental, result of mental and physical activity, organisational change, travel, exceptionally hot or cold working environments, or work scheduling. It can be further compounded by personal and lifestyle factors such as sleep, health and family commitments. Causes of fatigue can be short term or they can accumulate over time. Every business and every industry is affected to some degree by fatigue, but there are some types of work and some sectors that have an inherently higher risk, particularly when you have shift work. Work schedules, such as shift work schedules, can impact the time workers have to physically and mentally recover from work. As sleep and rest are the usual way that we recover from um, physically and mentally demanding tasks, it's important that we get a good amount and a good quality of sleep. It's important to understand that the length and quality of sleep time and also the length of time since we last rested can impact on a worker's ability to perform efficiently, effectively and safely. Under Australian work health and safety laws, everyone in the workplace has a responsibility to ensure that fatigue does not pose a risk to the health and safety of themselves or to others in that workplace. In today's discussion, we're going to explore some of the ways that fatigue can, in a workplace can impact on health and safety and how more effectively it can be managed. We'll explore the impact that sleep has on our physical and mental health and how employers can design working hours and rosters that encourage good sleep and recovery opportunities for workers. Our panellists will also take a look at the responsibility that employees have for making sure that their fatigue does not impact on the health and safety of others in their workplace. I'm looking forward to hearing today from the evidence and the data that the panel can share with us to help us all understand the impact of fatigue better. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our panellists for today's discussion. Dr Carmel Harrington is an Australian sleep scientist whose insights into sleep have helped improve the health and well-being of many Australians. She is an honorary research fellow at Westmead Children's Hospital and a founding member of the Australian Sleep Foundation. Carmel has also authored two books on, on, on sleep, best-selling books, The Sleep Diet and The Complete Guide to a Good Night's Sleep. We're also pleased to have Professor Drew Dawson with us today. Drew is the director of the Appleton Institute and an internationally acclaimed sleep scientist recognised for his work in the area of sleep and fatigue research, organisational psychology and human behaviour, and the human implications of hours of work. Having worked extensively in a number of industries, Drew has in instigated fatigue management programs, particularly in the contents of shift work. And finally, today's facilitator is the internationally renowned Professor David Capel. 
David has over 30 years experience as an independent work health and safety consultant and 10 years in corporate and research, and research employment. David is adjunct professor at the Centre of Ergonomics and Human Factors at La Trobe University and a senior research fellow from the Federation University in Ballarat. He's also a certified ergonomist in Australia and in the US. Would you please welcome me in, join me in welcoming our panellists today as I hand over to David. Thank you, Mark. And uh, firstly, welcome to our large audience here today. Thank you for making the time to join us. And also welcome to those who are viewing online. And, uh, and this is part of the virtual seminar series and uh, it's a pleasure to facilitate this discussion about fatigue at work. Um, and uh, I'd like to maybe address my first question to Carmel because of your extensive research on uh, this area of sleep. Just for the audience, do you want to just um, highlight what have we learned from the research in relation to sleep in the context of just what do we need in our general health and wellbeing? There's some of us, I've got a colleague who seems to get by on four to six hours a night, I need eight. Others need it certain times of the day. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of individual variability, but tell us a bit about what the research has told us about sleep. Yeah, well, we, we know from population studies that the recommended amount of sleep is between seven to nine hours, but it is an individual measure. So as you know, you need eight. I know I need eight and a half. So you sort of need to know what you need uh, and try to get that. But of course, there are variations, genetic variations, and there's a short sleep gene. So about three to 4% of the community actually only need about five hours sleep to do everything that they need to do in sleep that we mere mortals need seven to nine hours sleep. So you need to be aware of what you need uh, and try to get that. If not, you will be sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. mm. And Mark also talked about the quality of sleep. Do you want to just highlight a, a bit about what do we mean by quality sleep? Um, well, lots of us um, may spend a lot of time in bed and actually don't feel refreshed when we wake up. And it could be that there's an underlying sleep disorder there or indeed we spend three hours in the middle of the night awake. So time in bed is not necessarily a good indicator of the quality of sleep. The big measure is that sleep is meant to make you feel refreshed and rejuvenated when you wake up, able to meet the challenges and the joys of the day. If you feel like that's not happening, then maybe one of the things you need to be looking at is your sleep. Mm. So the segue is into, well, what do we learn from this in relation to shift work? Mm. Um, have you got any particular areas of research in looking at the um, prevention of fatigue in how we approach shift work? Well, we know that um, all of us will suffer uh, mental and health, uh, physical health consequences if we don't get enough sleep or we increase our likelihood of suffering those. And this is a little bit more exacerbated in the shift worker because not only are they generally get less sleep than they need, they also have circadian disruption because they have to work during the night hours. And these two things combined seem to increase the likelihood of developing um, physical ill health or mental ill health. Now, uh, the other thing with shift workers, anywhere between 5 to 20 per cent will develop something called shift work disorder. Um, and the hallmark signature of that is inability to get to sleep and or to maintain sleep. And excessive sleepiness during the day, which may not be connected to shift at all. Um, one of the reasons this is really quite a negative thing for the shift worker to develop is because it absolutely affects their quality of life and increases their uh, chance of developing severe depression. Mm -hmm. Drew, um, feel free to comment on, on your research on this relationship with shift work, but in doing so, do you want to talk us through about this, how we've tried to administratively manage it through originally this prescriptive approach towards shift work uh, and movement towards a risk-based approach? And maybe just tell us about your research in that area. Yeah, I think there's been a trend perhaps for the last 20 years. 20 years ago, the assumption was that we will negotiate our, <coughs> excuse me, our rules of rostering and that if we agree on a set of rules for rostering as part of our enterprise bargaining agreement, then those rules will constitute a safe system of work. Mm -hmm. And I think what we saw historically happen was that 
third party representation rights disappeared from the Industrial Relations Commission back in the mid 90s. And there has been a lot of economic changes in Australia over the last 20 or 30 years. The net result of that is lots of people agreed to rules of rostering that are probably demonstrably unsafe. That is because either they wanted to make more money or the organisation wanted the productivity gains. From around about the parliamentary inquiry in 2000 called um, the Midnight Oil Inquiry, there was a recommendation to the government that we should approach shift work from a risk-based approach. And the idea behind a risk-based approach is to say that effectively fatigue is with us always. It's impossible to develop a shift work system that will have people not being fatigued. The net consequence of that is is a fundamental shift. That is, instead of thinking about I'm compliant with my rules of rostering, therefore it's safe, it's about saying what's the likelihood that my staff will be fatigued and what level of control do I need to implement within the workforce in order to manage that risk. And we've seen this shift to what's called performance-based approaches to safety since the Rovins review in 1972, and it's been a very long process. Um, H.L. Mencken famously said, for every complex problem there's a simple solution and it's usually wrong. And nowhere is that probably more relevant than the area of shift work and rules of rostering. It's been challenging for organisations to work out how to risk assess, a risk assess a roster and how to work out what controls I should or shouldn't have in place. And the reason for this is that the risk profile for different jobs can be quite different. And people don't like sometimes the complexity associated with this. So maybe Carmel, if, if the comfort is to say, well, at least we've complied with the regulations, how do we address this individual difference that you're talking about mm -hmm. so that the individuals feel engaged in this process? And see, this is the real, real risk, isn't it? We can comply with regulation without engaging in the spirit of the regulation, which is actually to make us safer and the workplace safer. So how do we engage the individual? I think education is one of the keys. Um, I, people make decisions about the hours they work and the, the amount they sleep um, based on perceived economic and performance benefits. But they often make those decisions without being fully informed of the true cost so I think it's really important that we start to talk about the true cost and allow these people to make informed decisions. Now I liken it to when, you know, these days we, you know, we might have a bar of chocolate or a piece of cake and, but we know it's wrong, it's not good for us but we'll do it anyway. But lots of people are making decisions about sleep and their lack of without actually knowing the true consequences. So the very first step we need to do is engage them in that bit of information. Of course they can continue to make ill-informed and bad, bad decisions from our perspective, but they may have very good reasons to ignore the information we're telling them. And the other thing I think we need to do is engage people in education in modern technology. So lots of, um, not so many companies anyway, actually provide um, education materials and there's little re research to support that it works. But a lot of the research uh, education materials actually don't get to the night shift worker. So how do we do it better? And I think we can use mobile technology. We can allow people, with, apps have been developed. There was a study um, published last year with pilots and they allowed them, it was an app education. And so what they did is not only did they get information on sleep and fatigue management, but they were given a very practical application so they could key in when was your flight going, what time zones you're going to move to, et cetera, et cetera. So they could move their, organise their sleep, their fatigue management and their nutrition so that a better outcome. And what they found at the six month mark, the people, the pilots that actually engage, it was only 50% that engage, but the pilots that did engage actually had better fatigue management, better sleep quality and better nutrition. So we can do education better and we can engage the personal by making it personal. Yeah. Do, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think there's a couple of interesting points there. One I'd like to make is that the research tells us that half the time that somebody is fatigued in the workplace, it's due to non-work related causes. Mm -hmm. They've been up with a sick child or they're driving back from somewhere after a holiday. Half the risk in Australian workplaces comes from factors that are under the control of the employees outside of the workplace. So I think one of the big areas, the low fruit here, is to start to think about how we manage that aspect of it. And I think going back to Carmel's point about education, 
if we look at what happened with alcohol and drug um, regulation from the 70s, I remember going to work in the 70s where drink driving was funny. Yes. And we've gone through a process over the last 30 or 40 years where that's fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. I think from an education perspective, we need to say to people, this is how much sleep you need in order to work safely. In the same way as we say, you can't have more alcohol or a certain type of drug in your system than this amount in order to work safely. And people will say, oh, but we have individual differences and there's a short sleep gene and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm also going to make the point is there are huge inter-individual differences in the effects of alcohol on people or drugs on their cognitive capacity or error rates. It doesn't stop us as a community making that decision. And I suspect the research tells us that somewhere between six hours on a regular basis most people, most of the time, if they fall below that threshold, will be at about double the risk of accident or injury. Mm -hmm. And in a single night, they go below five hours sleep. We can show measurable impairment that's inconsistent with a safe system of work. What's really interesting is, from a cultural perspective, the argument that was put forward in the 70s is, well, we can't make blood alcohol 0.08 or 0.05 or 0.1 because everybody's different we see exactly the same argument now with sleep. And my point would be is we need to give people clear guidelines to say, if you've had less than this amount of sleep, tell someone. Mm. And the tell someone is the duty under the act to look after yourself, look after your colleagues, inform your supervisor in the context of what may be happening out of work. Yeah, this has been a very controversial area because under a lot of workplaces, the culture is not such that that may necessarily be well interpreted. Mm -hmm. Our general recommendations to workplaces are <clears throat> you may report it to your supervisor and you will manage it on the day, but if it happens more often than one would expect, then that needs to be managed by an employee assistance program or an mm -hmm. occupational hygienist or somebody outside of the employee supervisor relationship. Mm -hmm mainly because the supervisors often aren't sufficiently skilled and there are authority gradients and power differentials that make that a very complicated conversation. So just in the context of um, those who do have to work 24-7 like uh, medical specialists in the hospitals in acute care, um, you've talked about self-management of fatigue. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how that assists them with their cognitive uh, performance in looking after us as a community member? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a difficult area, but also one of the most exciting new areas in fatigue research, which is in many industries, we don't have an unlimited number of staff. So for example, with some work we did for Queensland Health, we went to the community and said, how many hours do you think a doctor should work? And they said 12 to 16 should be the maximum. And then we said, well, <clears throat> if we did that, we're about 800 doctors short. Would you rather a tired doctor or no doctor at all? And of course, overwhelmingly, the community said, no, a tired doctor will be fine, thank you. So again, it's a really complex risk equation here that you need to think about. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we need to think about is, for many organisations, how to work safely whilst fatigued has become a very important area of redesigning workplaces in ways that people can work safely whilst fatigued. Mm -hmm. Our research, for example, in the aviation industry shows that is if the pilot tells the co-pilot or vice versa that the other person is fatigued, they're much more likely to detect an error by that individual and therefore to reduce the risks associated with that. Similarly in hospitals, if a team is doing a handover and lets other people know what the fatigue levels are, people unsurprisingly, are more conscious of that. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing a lot of work in the last couple of years about how do you identify that you're fatigued and how do you redesign the work task in ways that you can operate in what we call fatigue mode. Mm -hmm. So building on the threat and error management literature, um, we have worked with a number of aviation partners and they will say at a certain level of fatigue, <clears throat> we will operate in fatigue mode. I won't go into how we define that, but to say in very simple terms, if you reach a certain level of fatigue on the flight deck or in the operating theatre, tell people and do things differently. Mm -hmm. So surgeons will consciously slow down and they will empower people to challenge them 
in the event that they make a mistake. So this redesign or reproceduralisation of the workplace is a very significant way that we can reduce risk even when people are tired. So Carmel, just in terms of say a, a simple analogy in the manufacturing industry where somebody does a particular sequence of tasks and they're fatigued, um, what do you see in the research as the consequence to their behaviour when something goes wrong with that particular model? Yes, look, we know when we're um, tired, our ability to um, react to new pieces of information is quite impaired. And so while we can do automatic tasks, A, B, C, um, quite comfortably, if we go A, B, C, F, we're not quite sure how to incorporate F. So to put that in everyday language, many of us have driven home tired and some of us may not remember how we got home because we've done the drive automatically. And we do it, we can do it night after night. But if someone cr runs across the road or a new piece of uh, something happens, we can't react to it because cognitively we're impaired. And that's what happens and that's why we have these people who do a job for 20 years really, really well and on one night an absolute catastrophe happens because a new piece of information has come across. So it really is important, I couldn't agree more about alerting people about fatigue. We have conversations now about, in fact, we applaud people who exercise and who are fit. We applaud people who have a good diet and eat good food and we talk about it in the workplace. Oh, I'm having a salad today or I'm doing this, that, the other. We need to have a conversation around, I'm, I slept really well last night and in, rather than it being a demerit because you haven't slept well and I'm going to have to be performance managed because I'm not sleeping well. The declaration that I am taking my sleep seriously because I want to be the best version of me and be really productive and safe at work should be an open conversation and one that we encourage. Mm -hmm. And we'll see if we start that. And the start of that is that actually this fatigue mode, a declaration of, okay, I'm too long on task or I haven't had the best uh, lead up period to this. I'm fatigued. How are we going to best manage it? It's an open conversation. We shouldn't try to put it under the carpet because mm -hmm. that's the way big mistakes mm -hmm. begin to happen. So just in that context where you do have people who work night, night shifts mm. uh, regularly, there's a, a lot of debate about should we allow them to nap or power nap, whatever the term is. Or what, what's the research telling us about that? Yeah, look, the research, a napping is good for all of us. So <laughs> we can all benefit from um, a brief nap of about 20 minutes. And the reason we say 20 minutes is because we want to stay in the light sleep. We don't want to get into the deep sleep, which will increase the likelihood of waking up with sleep inertia, which is that feeling of disorientation and lethargy. And it takes some time to dissipate. On balance, the literature shows that a nap of 20 minutes um, in the early hours of the morning, probably between one and three, are quite beneficial and it will increase your alertness for a, a period of time. Naps taken after that time, um, not as beneficial and increase the likelihood of sleep inertia. Um, certainly napping can be used to good benefit for, for night shift workers, but also sleeping prior to your evening or night shift because of course fatigue is not just a matter of sleep duration but it's length of time awake beforehand as well. And so if we, we can actually have either a short nap um, before our shift or even a, a complete sleep of about 90 to 110 minutes. Of course the caveat is always be aware of sleep inertia and it might take up to 60 minutes for that to dissipate if you wake up from deep sleep. Mm -hmm. mm. You've done some research on this, Drew. Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, I would agree with what Carmel says, but one of the things that I think she hit on earlier, which is quite important, is the culture within the organisation. Mm. And I think one of the things that's important to understand is that many organisations, fatigue is what we call a forbidden topic or a taboo narrative. If you're an anthropologist, these are the things that you can't talk about. And the reasons for this are simple. I've sat in many EBA negotiations and it's don't mention fatigue because it's going to cost 10% in the next EBA or it's secret code for overtime reduction strategy or many of the other implications of it. And I think organisations need to think really carefully about this. One of the things that we've noticed is in terms of understanding the risk profile of people in a workplace, just going to people and saying, tell us the dumb stuff you do when you're fatigued. Mm -hmm. If you sit around with a group of 10 or 15 people, they will tell you all of the dumb things that get done when people are fatigued. And that provides you a very good starting point to start to think about how could we redesign or reproceduralize so these are less likely to cause an accident or the consequences 
are reduced. So I think it's really important for organisations to think, how do we have this discussion? How do we embark upon this forbidden narrative? And I guess my advice would be do it out of the context of the EBA. Mm. Our experience is once you're in an EBA, that's a really bad time because there are so many financial and cultural tensions around the topic. The other point being is that if you do have that conversation outside of the context of the EBA, people are actually quite happy to talk about it. Mm. They'll tell you all the dumb stuff they did and they'll tell you how to fix it. Mm -hmm. But we just don't allow that conversation to happen within our workplaces. Um, I suppose let's talk a little bit about the white collar workers um, who don't necessarily do shift work but experience fatigue. Have you got any evidence about fatigue in their industry sector? Yeah, well, not comprehensive evidence, but we've done a number of um, consulting and research jobs with Big Oil. And I remember very clearly the work with BP and Shell, which showed that when we looked at fatigue related accidents, they were much more likely to happen for middle level managers, sales managers, people on the road, than they were to happen on the mine, so to speak. That is, <coughs> unregulated working hours are much more likely to happen in junior and middle managers than they are in heavily industrialised workforces. And again, because there aren't unions, there aren't EBAs, and there are staff contracts, as they say, the coercive pressure of the organisation to work long hours can actually lead to quite unsafe work practices, mm -hmm. particularly around extended commuting. So people will work their day and then drive to the next place they have to be the following day. And sometimes they can be clocking 16 to 20 hour days mm -hmm. with extended commuting. So Karma, with 16 to 20 hour days, I mean, what's the research telling us about our cognitive yeah. capacities? Well, after about 16 or 17 hours, your cognitive capacity is at the same time, at the same level as um, 0.05 alcohol consumption. So clearly we're not thinking very well when we have... See, our body clock is set up so that when we awake in the morning and expose ourselves to sunlight, about 16 hours later, our, our body is ready to sleep. And we, we seem to forget that sleep f f um, forms a vital function. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to put sleep off. Everyone thinks, oh, I haven't got time to sleep. But we have such enormous cognitive deficits when we don't sleep. Any performance gains that we think we're making due to not sleeping and staying awake are actually just um, in the air. They're not actually happening. We don't make performance gains. And, and to the point of um, what's happening with the non-shift worker, with the rise of the mobile office, everyone's available. We've all got our iPhone, we've all got our iPad. And um, a study of Australian workers last year found that one in four day workers actually got less than the recommended seven to nine. One in four uh, of the workers only sometimes got seven hours sleep. And one in four workers felt extremely tired or completely exhausted and thought it was really affecting their physical, mental health and their social interaction. So it's not just shift workers. And again, the commuting that these people do at that, that level, they're causing a lot of issues outside of their own mm -hmm. particular selves. Yeah. So you, your research has um, looked at the influence of the 24-hour cycle in building these rosters. Um, have you got any advice in relation to roster structuring and the relationship to your research on sleep? Yeah, look, there's no silver bullet. Like, I couldn't agree with, with, everyone knows that, there's no silver bullet here. And when we think about shift roster, the shift roster itself is not gonna solve the problem because there's so many other variables. So how long is the person's commute to work? What's their domestic situation? Do they have an underlying sleep disorder that's not giving them good quality sleep? What sort of chronotype are they? Do they like mornings or do they like the evenings because we know that allows them to tolerate shift better? So we need to keep that into account when we think about shift rosters and put it in the design in a way if we can. We also need to realise that optimal shift time and work-life balance for the shift worker may not play out against what is best of the broader community because the longer time on shift, if we have extended 12-hour shifts, we're increasing the risk to the broader community when that person either is driving a big truck or a train or whatever. So there is a, a tendency to um, the 12 hour shift length and whether or not that's a good thing or not is really to be debatable, even though employees like it because it 
compresses their work week and um, gives them more time with their family. Employers like it because it makes their shift rostering easier, but it actually increases their risk of injury at the end of the shift. So it's all this sort of balancing. But there are some things that we know about shift rostering and design that we've learned over the last 40 years. So this is a pretty new area of research, you know, sleep, shift work, fatigue management. It's only really been around for 40 or 50 years and we're learning a lot. We had to start implementing what we've learned. So we know that um, fast forward rotating shifts probably work well because they minimise or reduce circadian disruption, increase access to um, increased um, sleep duration. Morning shifts, early start morning shifts are to be avoided because um, shifts that start before seven o'clock in the morning actually decrease sleep duration because people have the imperative of staying up at night anyway and watching TV and socialising. And it actually increases sleepiness. So we shouldn't start shifts too early in the morning. A number of consecutive shifts in a row actually decrease um, uh, alertness and increase sleepiness. And extending the 12 hour shift, so you do overtime at the end of the 12 hour shift, actually just increases your injury risk and should be avoided, I think. And so there's lots of things, it's a complex balance uh, of how we design shift rosters, but it's also looking at the individual. So I'm going back to this individual story as well. So what are the particular vulnerabilities of the worker? So do they have an underlying sleep disorder? If they do, it needs to be addressed, all right? So they will feel better about themselves, but they'll be more productive. The other thing we know over the years is that whether you're an owl or a lark really affects your ability to tolerate shift work. Now, giving the worker information about themselves, as simple as, do you prefer the morning or do you prefer the night, actually engages the person up and may improve their uptake of fatigue management strategies, which we know is probably not as good as it should be. So engaging that personal is, is really important. And with shift design and rostering, we should put in things that we know work. So napping is something I think should be uh, recognised in the workplace, especially at night shift. Good lighting as well. We know that can be alerting and there's some great research, emerging research coming out showing that the red wavelength is, um, the warmer wavelength is alerting but doesn't suppress melatonin as much. So there's lots of things we can do and there's opportunities that we now have to start implementing things but at the same time making sure the individual is engaged in this and we can move forward together. It's not just the roster and it's not just the duration of the shift, it's not just anything. It's, so yeah. I just wonder, Drew, if you think back to the research over the 40 odd years, yeah, uh... have we come a long way in this <clears throat> space? Well, I'm going to take a slightly different point of view and say <clears throat> people have been sitting around trying to work out the perfect roster for about 80 years and a lot of really smart people have sat down and they haven't solved the problem yet. So maybe we need to think about this a bit differently. And going back to what Carmel said earlier, I would make the suggestion that people need a working time arrangement including shift work for operational needs. The secret is to then go back and say, how much sleep are you getting? And to get the answer to that question, and that can be done through both formal risk assessment techniques, but also by talking to people. And I think if you're finding that there are significant periods of time where people are averaging less than six hours a night, you've probably got a problem and you need to control those risks. And if you don't, then maybe it's less of a concern. But I have come to the point after 20 years of looking at this, the idea of thinking I can come up with a perfect set of rules that compliance will ensure safety, the research tells us that there is too much variability between individuals, between workplaces, between tasks for that to actually be an effective strategy. And I suspect, like many things in life, we should stop banging our head against the wall because it'll feel really good when we do. Right. Let's, uh, let's take a little rest from that and just see whether we've got any questions from the audience who'd like to contribute to our discussion this morning. Would you like to just introduce, stand up and introduce yourself first? Thank you. Uh, my, na my name's Mark Smith and I'm from Safe Work Australia. And um, my question is from the perspective of businesses who are looking for quick wins. Now, what are some of the easily fixed mistakes that you see, see around managing fatigues from the, from the perspective of these businesses? Okay. Drew? <clears throat> I think the low fruit is around 
non-work related causes of fatigue. That is for many organisations, wrestling with the roster and the EBA is a lot of pain for very, very little gain. On the other hand, thinking about the culture and saying to people, tell us the dumb stuff when you do when you're fatigued and how can we stop that happening? Asking them about how much sleep that they can, how much sleep people are getting, enables organisations to do a pretty quick and dirty risk assessment and then to work out, do I need a little bit of control or do I need a lot of control? And I think there are enough tools around now in the marketplace that enable people to do pretty reasonable risk assessment and to assess the likely effectiveness of controls. But I would qualify that to say that we haven't done the research in enough detail to say this control will work like this in your organisation. And for most organisations now, we're recommending what we call post-implementation surveillance. Put it in place and look at it. Don't assume co compliance equals safety and don't assume that a control will work just because you put it in place. So that normal process of put it in place, evaluate it, corrective action and that do loop make a lot of sense and enable you to deal with the complexity of workplace, individual task, etc. Mm -hmm. Carmel, do you want to make any quick win comments? Yeah, I think um, with quick win, Sometimes, it, um, especially in the white collar worker, it comes from the head. So if the person de deems, if your employer is deeming productivity equals time behind the desk, um, then you're going to spend a lot of time behind the desk and you're going to be sleep deprived. So really it, it means taking on board that probably somebody can't work efficiently much more than 45 hours a week. So don't expect your, your worker to do that because you're going to have burnout and all the consequences, lost productivity. Mm -hmm. So I'd be looking at um, don't wear lack of sleep on your heart as a badge of honour because it isn't. Uh, you made the point before about um, the greyness between work and life balance. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as an emerging issue we need to think more about, in, particularly with the accessibility of technology? Mm. Oh, absolutely. And um, I do a lot of work uh, with children and they observe their parents always on the iPhone or the iPad or whatever and they deem success as this. All right? And that's what kids are doing and we're seeing right down to little ones not getting anywhere near uh, enough sleep. And I go back, there's a quote from one of the grandfathers of sleep that says that if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, that it's the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. And that's true. And we know that little kids need more sleep than big kids and, that, and big kids need more sleep than adults. And we're, we're seeing this complete greyness around sleep because life is so exciting. And we have a thing now called FOMO, fear of missing out. So even when you think, oh, I'm not going to look at my emails till tomorrow morning, you know, you might just sneak a look just in case you've missed out on something. Chances are the world is not going to stop or blow up because you haven't looked at your email overnight. So we're losing our respect for sleep and we're losing the discipline around sleep. And we had it 50 years ago because 50 years ago, if anyone rang your house at 8 o'clock at night, someone had died. They didn't do it. At 12 o'clock at night, the TV went off, you know. But, They'd say good night from us and good night to you, and we had nothing to keep us awake. We would sleep. We don't do it now, and we're seeing the consequences. Do you see these social pressures changing sleep? Yes, but I think part of the thing is to respect those choices and to understand that in many cases the decision for a student to study all night and end up in a fabulous course and to have a fabulous career may be a good short term. Mm -hmm. arrangement. And I think part of the difficulty I see, and this is probably a little controversial, is that there is a kind of a catastrophizing that goes over sleep. Mm -hmm. And I'd point out that anything that we do that's important to sleep will be a very plastic behaviour. Otherwise, we wouldn't have evolved to the point where we are. So I think when we look at education programs, I think telling people the world will end if they don't sleep is a bit like telling kids drugs will kill you. And I think a harm minimisation model rather than a model of catastrophising it to people is probably likely to be more successful because it allows people to say, well, you know, every once in a while I am going to stay up all night and party and the effects mm. on my social life will be fabulous. Mm. Uh, and, and I'd also make the comment, and a couple of very famous sleep researchers have worked in this area, which is to say 
People slept a long time in the olden days because there wasn't anything else to do. <laughs> and we used to exercise a lot because we had to. That is, the world is changing. And I suspect if you approach kids in particular catastrophizing sleep, they're just going to look at you at the same way that they do when you try to talk to them about drugs and alcohol and all of those kind of mm. things. So I think it's a complex cultural thing that we need to look at. And I'd say the same thing with employees is that, you know, sometimes going on a holiday and getting back the last thing before you start work does have advantages. I think if we think about it from a harm minimisation perspective, we're probably going to get a better reception mm -hmm. than a catastrophizing the world's going to end. Mm. Sure. Couldn't agree more, but I think, again, along those same lines, information is key. Choose not to make the decision for all sorts of yeah. reasons. I want to have the best party tonight, and I know alcohol interferes with my sleep, but I'm going to have a drink anyway. You know, make the decision, but make it on an informed basis rather than just thinking it's okay and I've got no idea why I didn't sleep very well last night, which is what happens with people. So that level of information is, is really key. And again, you make everything dire and you, everything's going to end, everyone switches off anyway. Yeah. You know, they don't engage. Yes. So it's not all, it's not black and it's not white, but inf information, I think, is, is key. Yeah. In and I, I think one of the other things that's quite interesting is pay it back. That is, yeah, have a big night, pay it back. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. catch up, go to bed early the next night when that sleep was not displacing fun activities. And I think mm. that's part of the challenge about how do we get people to think about it in a culturally sophisticated yes. way yes. that will actually result in behaviour change. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, another question. Uh, yes. Helen Wrighton, I'm also from Safe Work Australia. Um, just following on on that last point, actually, um, in terms of paying it back, how much is there, is there research quantifying how much you need to pay back per hour missed or any other way of, of knowing when you've actually caught up? Yeah. And, and how do you do it? How do you get that time? <coughs> this is the good news. Um, everybody says you can't play sleep back. We ran a series of studies over the last five years where we sleep deprived people up to 48 hours of continuous sleep loss and some went as far as 64 hours. All of those people returned to normative, normal cognitive function with two nine and a half hour sleeps. So you don't actually have to, the body is very good at sleeping efficiently or sleeping faster as we like to say. So the good news is you don't have to necessarily pay it back hour for hour. If you can, that's great, but we would suggest if you short your sleep by a certain amount, you probably only have to pay back half of that to regain the function because there is some plasticity. If you're tired, the brain sleeps faster. That's a controversial view because some people want to catastrophise things, but I suspect if you pay it back at 50 cents in the dollar, you're probably going to be fine. And the yeah. point at which you know you've paid it back is when you feel well. You feel good. So you wake up thinking, I'm okay. You know, that's really important. Sometimes we miss the most obvious. You know, we talk about fatigue measures and risk, and, and that's really important. But are you yawning? Are your eyelids drooping? Well, chances are you've got a fatigue issue on your hands. You know, yes. let's make some things quite practical. And um, when we wake up, and we've had, we've all had, say, for example, when we have young children or we've got a big exam or a big, you know, gone a great party holiday, we come back or whatever, we feel really exhausted. And then we have a few sleeps and we feel good. Well, we know we've rested sufficiently. But my thing, though, is too, to realise on a regular basis what you ideally would require. Try to get it. Your body is really adaptable and it does adapt to situations. But if you get what you need on a pretty regular basis, you're going to be optimal health and um, mm -hmm. um, we have a very function. simple strategy which we will talk to people from a clinical perspective is, do you need an alarm clock to wake Absolutely. up? <clears throat> if you need an alarm clock to wake up, mm. you're not getting enough sleep. Yeah. And that's a very simple way very of simple. making that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about those of us that do need an alarm clock because we've got a long way to drive or we've got to catch an aeroplane or... Go to bed earlier. <laughs> and, and that's not without its challenges because yeah, there's it's... lots of fun things to do in the evening. Yeah. But the other thing is too, I mean, some people, they have a four o'clock flight to catch, or you can't catch a flight at four o'clock, can you? But a really early morning flight. So they need to get up at four o'clock in the morning and they think they're going to go to sleep really early. And they go to bed, say at eight o'clock, 8.30, hoping to go to sleep. But at that point in time, your circadian alertness is on the rise. So you are not going to fall asleep very easily. And the longer you stay in bed, not falling asleep, due to your physiology of alertness, 
the more anxious you become. So you start producing these anxiety hormones. So you get the worst night's sleep possible rather than the best night's sleep possible. So sometimes I think more practically is, um, okay, you, if you can't, you've got to make sure you go to sleep or go to bed after the peak of your alertness that night. And if you get a slightly shortened sleep that night, make sure you sleep more the next night. So it's, it's this idea of balance, isn't it, always, yeah. yeah. I've been amazed when you go to China, yes. how many people sleep on the train that they got up early <laughs> for. And in fact, if you catch many of the red eyes mm. or the early morning flights in, um, on Qantas, you'll see a lot of people sleeping. Mm. Yes. And that's not such a bad that's thing. That's not a bad thing. No. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm just wondering for each of you, if you want to leave the audience here and, and are watching online, uh, some key messages of where we are in 2016 at the moment on the research on fatigue management, shift work, work, w sleep. Yeah, I think probably the single most important thing for an organisation to do is to say managing fatigue is not an industrial enterprise bargaining agreement issue, it's actually a safety issue, and it's okay to talk about it. That is, our experience is once an organisation makes a decision to talk about fatigue as a safety issue, they're pretty good at solving it. Mm. It's only when it gets tied up in money and productivity and all of those factors and becomes a forbidden narrative that then everybody ignores it and it creates problems. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the take home message, it's not just about the employer providing a safe workplace because most are engaged in doing that. It's about the individual engaging as well in their own personal safety and fatigue management because it's a, a collaboration between the two. We can't have someone saying this is what you're going to do because we'll find ways around it. So let's engage the individual in the whole story and we may well move forward with fatigue management. Great. So thank you for the studio audience for your interest and participation and thank you to all those that are watching us online. And, uh, and thank you to Drew and thank you to Carmel and uh, I'll ask you to join me to uh, uh, thank us together. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you.